<laughs> I got you. No, you just want the deadpan pubic thrown in every so often. I got you. <laughs> See, this is a funny thing. I already started reading the paper. So, like, this is all going in the video anyway. You're going to just have me say pubic, pubic, pubic like a million times. So, it's already there. I guess I could cut it and just restart and be like, the extinction limits of the duty to rescue by Per Bon, Linnaeus University, in public reason. <laughs> and here's how Peter Singer famously discusses the duty to rescue, relating it to a consequentialist principle of preventing bad things from happening. Since Semiox says, teachers who are going to teach sex ed and do it without giggling practice does a cocktail party just dropping in a very giggly word and going on with it and just, yeah, keep doing it. Yeah, but you have to understand, like, I'm sitting here reading stuff all the time. Uh, like, I have no problem just, like, does it look like I have a problem, like, saying pubic and just keep going? I don't. And, um... Like, I've read, actually, you know, this is, like, a 18-plus stream. I've We've read, like, kind of heinous things on stream. And uh, so, like, it does happen that, like, I get words that I normally would not be saying on stream. So it's, like, that's the thing. Although, I guess on Twitch, I have I had to say anything that was TOS that was in a paper? I don't think I've ever actually had to, like, say banned words on Twitch uh, in a paper. But, I mean, I just realized that, I mean, that that is definitely a possibility. So... But yeah, I usually, I don't have a problem reading or saying them. Alright, so. The, dis the duty to rescue. If it is in our power to prevent something bad from happening, without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. An application of this principle would be as follows. If I'm walking past a shallow pond and see a child drowning in it, I ought to wade in and pull the child out. This will mean getting my clothes muddy, but this is insignificant. While the death of the child would be presumably, oh, excuse me, would presumably be a very bad thing, the principle takes first no account of proximity or distance. It makes no moral difference whether the person I can help is a neighbor's child ten yards from me or a Bengali whose name I shall never know ten thousand miles away. Secondly, the principle makes no distinction between cases in which I am the only person who could possibly do anything and, and cases in which I am just one among millions in the same position. Yeah, so this is, um, we've dis I've discussed this on stream before, that this is the principle of that if you can help someone, why don't you do it? And all the other things that might be like incidental don't matter, um, according to uh, Peter Singer. So... You, like there is a sense I read a paper a while back where um, someone says do you have a duty to help people who are nearby you more than people who are far they took up this exact thing where Peter Singer says you know if it's um 10 yards or a Bengali 10,000 miles away and they say no you actually do have a more um, like the closer they are to you it actually does matter so uh, we've read paper on that before too so the thing is like Peter Sing Singer's line is that it doesn't matter um, the only thing that matters is like you know happiness and like re relief of suffering and so the idea is it doesn't matter time space none of that matters other people disagree but like that's Peter Singer for you okay so what we're doing here is again with the limits of duty to rescue so they're gonna start cutting down on this Hence, according to Singer, we have a duty to rescue whenever our in intervention is sufficient to prevent something bad from happening and, is, and when it does not involve a sacrifice of comparable moral importance. His account raises at least two objections, both of which emanate from the consequentialist idea that we have a duty to rescue whenever our intervention is sufficient to prevent something bad from happening. The first objection concerns consequentialism's inability to make it an important distinction between two different ways in which we can have a duty to rescue. The second objection... Uh, concerns the maximization inherent in consequentialism and how it may cause confusion as to whom the duty to rescue applies. Victor Andre, hey, what's up? How you been? How you doing? Um, just on my grind at the moment, you know? Things are okay, I guess. You know, not terrible. <laughs> not great. I wish I was better, but hey, still here, still kicking, doing okay. So, uh, yeah, hope you're doing well. Let me know. And yeah, we're reading this paper on, you know, whether or not you uh, need to rescue someone who's in need. <coughs> uh, sufficiency versus necessity and different kinds of duties. 
The idea that we have a duty to rescue whenever it is sufficient to prevent something bad from happening, regardless of whether our intervention is also necessary, seems to ignore the fact that some agents may have more of a duty to intervene than others, at least in a given situation. I mean, that makes more sense. Like, you know, a child's parent has more duty to like help their child than like a stranger does. Like if like a kid like hurts themselves and, you know, like, you know, say scrapes up their name. So like they're bleeding. They're, if like their parent is right there, the parent should help them. Now, if I see a kid scraped up their knee, granted, they could like still continue to get more hurt if like they don't get medical attention. And so it's like, should I go help a kid who is bleeding? It's like, yeah, I feel so. Like that would be good. But like if their parent's there, that parent should help because I don't want to go deal with someone else who's like scraped up kid. Like, you know, that could get a lot of, uh, you know, medical whatever crap. I don't want to deal with their like blood all over me. It's like they know their kid. They know what like, maybe the kid will freak out maybe the kid doesn't like blood but like that's the sort of thing so it does seem like there is a uh, hierarchy here there's a structure to this and so author continues of course if you are the only person present and you can easily rescue the child from drowning then it is both necessary and sufficient that you intervene and therefore it would also be obvious that you have a duty to rescue the child can you share what i'm listening to yeah this is um music um you can uh, you can always type in exclamation point music and it pops up you do that and it pops up. So this is um, DMCA Stream Beats by Ill Advised Records. Uh, the guy's name is Dated. Uh, that's what he goes by. His name is a uh, blanking on his name, but doesn't matter. Chris Coat. And so um, you can go there, and he puts out a lot of these like dark lo-fi. That's like sort of his like whole reason to uh, raison de tra. Like uh, he puts out dark lo-fi music. He put out this. Uh, stream safe beat and it's basically um what i've been playing for a very long time now uh, i used to play hugo kant a live performance of his music because it was live it wasn't getting dmca'd but like i'm just nervous now i don't want because i put everything on youtube that i don't want it to get pulled down for dumb reasons and since this is like uh ill-advised um they, they literally said this is DMCA safe. I am taking the word for it. One time one of those songs did get flagged as the uh, song from uh, Ill-Advised, but it didn't get pulled down, so it was fine. I don't mind it being flagged. There wasn't any restriction on it, so it was okay. But yeah, I really, really uh, like uh, a lot of the stuff that comes out of Ill-Advised Records, and so I recommend. I bought their... They put out a vinyl for Halloween, and I actually bought the vinyl to support the business because, you know, I don't have a ton of money, but I can, you know, if you're going to put something out, I can throw you a few bucks, buy your thing. And I really appreciate the uh, stream beats. So, so. <coughs> it's all good stuff. <sighs> okay. Yeah. So this is the thing. But what if the, yeah, so again, a, ch a child is drowning and you're there, but... What if the child's parents are present in this, at the scene and do nothing, while well, both aware of what is happening and capable of intervening? Okay, yeah. Um, again, like if you're at work tomorrow, like they got a ton of mixes. Um, I personally like love their Halloween mixes because like that's how I found them a few years ago. Now they put out Halloween mixes. Yeah, so definitely go check them out. Um, so when I'm like doing work, um, there's something called seven beats music and they have like coffee. They call them coffee shop specials. You can search uh, YouTube for seven beats music. There is, uh, ill advised records. And then there's Lance's a uh, low Q do uh, low Q dubious who does a dark mood party mix. If you like the dark mood party mix, I can get you like, send me a message on like a, a whisper or whatever. If you want more music recommendations for like this kind of stuff. You can also search uh, Dark Jazz, but like, there's really nothing else like this. Okay. So, oh yeah. So, or what if a trained lifeguard employed to make the pond safe is present without intervening, although he is capable of doing so? Or what if the person who pushed the child into the water in the first place is there watching the child drown without intervening, although she could easily do so? Okay. Here's one of the things about philosophy that I completely fucking hate. And this is not the author's fault. This is just like standard philosophy stuff. These are extremely weird scenarios. These things have never, ever happened. No parents watch their child drown unless they're psychopaths. 
That doesn't happen. If there is a lifeguard there, unless they are a psychopath and you're in a horror film, they get, jump into action. If someone pushes the kid into the water and stands there laughing while they drown, they are a psychopath. None of these things that they're mentioning right here are realistic in any sense of like the reality. These things don't happen except in extreme cases. And in which case you can go rescue the kid and then go beat the fuck out of the parents afterwards because that'd be like literally the only reasonable thing to do. Like fuck those people. But like that's a thing. But for, yes, thank you, Sensei Max. But for standard philosophical discourse, we cite strong examples. Uh, yeah, but this pisses me off. It's like, yeah, these are, they seem like strong examples, even far-fetched, as you say, but they are so detached from everyday life. Like, you know, it's just so detached that, like, I find it weird. No, I know you're serious. That doesn't make me any less angry. Like, I'm angry at the state of the world of philosophy, not angry at you. Like, you are correct. Being correct doesn't make the world, like, you're accurate about the world. That doesn't make me less pissed off at the world. <laughs> they are trying to abstract, oh, I, I understand what they are attempting to do. That does not make me like what they are attempting to do. Because if you are so separated from reality, then... It's hard for me to accept your ethical conclusions if you are like e like the ethics that people are supposed to act in every day. If the examples are from every day, if you're talking about stuff that never, ever happens on Earth, then why should we be um, following stories about things that, uh, that don't happen on Earth? Like that haven't ever happened or are like completely deviant. Oh, thank you. You're trying to console me. It's not. It's never worked in the past since time. Philosophy does not console me. Philosophy pisses me off. <sighs> all right. Here's a good point, though, that the author makes. In all these cases, there exist certain relationships between the agents mentioned and the drowning child, and these relationships also create special duties on the part of the agents. That's correct. The idea that like people have relations to each other that make duties that is you know a normal thing. Since Samiak says, serious question. What about those situations where there is a one in a lifetime chance, a very freak situation that nonetheless did happen as documented that it only happened once? That's fine, but are you going to be making an ethics based on that one thing that happened one time? Um, would that piss me off more or less? No, the fact that it happened doesn't piss me off. I mean, there are freak occurrences. Um, for example, like, you know, people have like freak injuries all the time playing sports. And, you know, they're not that uncommon. You do hear about them. But, like, do you cancel the sport because, you know, one person got hurt one time? No. But, like, again, like, do you make your ethics uh, centered around, like, some very weird, unusual circumstances? I mean, if you're trying to do a metaphysics and be universal and talk about all the things all the time, you might think that you need to talk about it. But then again, you could say, look, we are talking about things that happen in real life, not these really weird situations. That's like, um, I mean, you mean those scenarios are better for to use for me? Um, they, m <sighs> no, 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 no. I don't. I'm more of a philosopher of the everyday, just in general. I am looking at what people are doing in their daily lives. Like, okay, so some space junk falls out of the sky. No, a meteor, not even space junk. Like a meteor falls out of the sky and kills somebody. I mean, you could say hand of God smote that person. You know? Are we going to change all the... Uh, like make that a fundamental thing that we have to take into account in our ethics or our theology that like, you know, something like a meteor killed one person that one time. I don't think that's how we should be going about things. Now, maybe a miracle like where God comes down and does something, then you have to talk about that. But like just some one freak accident. No, I don't think that's how we should be looking at the world. And that is a uh, thing that's particular to me. I mean, I know people are trying to make metaphysics where they're talking about all the things about all the people all the time, like forward, back in time, like in the ancient past and in the great future. We're going to always have to follow this law of uh, ethics. I don't find um, that very compelling in the sense that we have to go look at all the edge cases. Um, yeah. Now... 
I agree that if you can find an edge case that is an exception um, to a rule, that's a good thing. Um, but that's a lot of times that a lot of times when they're edge cases like this, you have to talk about them. But like, what's pissing me off here, and this is a good point. What's pissing me off here is not that these are edge cases. They're not because we don't have a theory yet. These are just really weird things. Like, are we going to make an ethics about psychotic people? Like, uh, parents that are watching their child drown are psychotic. Are you going to make an ethics around that? Is that a real edge case to your theory about people you're already thinking are, in some sense, broken? Like, do you make theories for broken people? And so, yeah, you can find edge cases, but are these even them? Like, these are weird. And so I don't, that's sort of my trouble with this. It's like, I don't think these are edge cases. Like trolley problem is an edge case that could, you know, it's weird, but like it's, um, maybe you have to have like a super villain to tie people to the tracks. But like, you know, there are sometimes hard decisions where it's damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. That's not that unusual that you have to make a decision like this. Is it unusual that a parent is watching their child drown and not moving? That's weird. I don't mind an edge case, but like, I don't even think these ca uh, qualify. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So the author makes sense. Parents have more of a duty to deal with their kids than other people. Like, I don't want to deal with your rug rats. Okay. We may call these relational duties. Parents have a special responsibility for their children that no one else has. Sure. They are morally obliged to look after their children and see to it that they come to no harm. Likewise, if a life, uh, likewise, a lifeguard employed to maintain the safety of a certain pond has a special responsibility to rescue a child about to drown there that, has, that no one else has. Yeah, the person like said they're going to do it, and if they don't, then they're a liar and a bad person. Okay, and a person who has pushed a child into the water and thereby exposed it to a life-threatening danger has a duty that no one else has to correct her wrongdoing by pulling the child out of the water. Yeah, if you realize that you pushed someone into the water, you thought it was funny, and then it turns out they can't swim, you got to fix that fast. Like, come on, that does happen. But like, it's like, if, but that's like a mistake. Like that I can understand. But like the parents not like getting the helping their kid. That's like very strange. Okay. If you, an unrelated passerby, find yourself by the pond in the company of any or all of these agents, it is rather it is that they rather than you who, who have a moral duty to rescue the child. It may be the case that it is sufficient that only one of you intervenes to rescue the child, but you are not all equally morally obliged to do so. The parents, the lifeguard, and the person who pushed your child into the water have, for different reasons, a duty to intervene that you do not have. Yeah, because that makes perfect sense. Like... Sure. Like, actually, this is fine. Because if you were already engaged with the child in some way, then you are, you are, like, already, in some sense, responsible for them. Okay. However, if all these people who have a relational duty to rescue the child either are unable to fulfill the duty or simply refuse to act in accordance with it, then it would be necessary for you to intervene to save the child from drowning. Yeah. You have to rely on strangers when you can't... Um, like the goodwill of others, basically, when not, when all else fails. Then you would have what we may call a duty of necessity emanating from the, excuse me, from the causal necessity of your intervention rather than from any special relationship between you and the drowning child. Hence, we do not all, we do not adhere to the view criticized by Joel Feinberg that apart from special moral relationships, our moral claim against others is not, is only to be let alone. Yeah, that seems very uh, loose, like that you just have to be very libertarian, that everyone uh, outside that you don't have any like, in, like personal relationship is uh, outside your scope of moral responsibility. I mean, that's just like uncivilized. We live in a civilization, like we are social animals. We live in a civilization. You have to actually try to look out for other people. Like it's nuts if like people think, oh yeah, just let the kid die. Like that's terrible. Yeah, if your intervention is necessary to save the child's life, and if you can intervene at no cost to yourself, then the child has a right to your intervention. I mean, we are expected. Of, it's a, kind of expected of you if like you can save the kid and wouldn't really screw you up. I mean, I understand. Maybe it will ruin your day or life, but like that's not a good excuse. But again, it's going to, like if you could just reach down, grab the kid, and pull them out. You should do that. It's like yeah. You'd be something would be kind of wrong with you if like someone's like suffering right there and all you got to do is be like 
eh. And that's it. It's like, come on. Be a de halfway decent person. Not even, just be like a, have a modicum of decency. Okay. But the primary duty to intervene rests with the people who stand in a special relationship to the child. If you have to intervene because they refuse to act in accordance with their relational duty to rescue, they are morally responsible not only for failing to help the child, but also for leaving it to you to make it to make up for their failure. Yeah, no one wants to have to clean up for crap parents. It's annoying. It is a weakness of the consequentialist version of the duty to rescue that it fails to distinguish in this way between relational duties and duties of necessity between agents with different different degrees of responsibility for fulfilling the duty to rescue. Okay, so this makes some sense. This is one of those things that, like, look, why do we, like, yes, you have a, a duty to help other people, but, like, the time and space thing does seem to matter. You have, this is an old argument that the uh, deontologists um, the Kantians have against the consequentialists that look you have a duty to your family and that is that is in addition to the duty you have like to other people and so you have to act differently to your family and people that you are in relation have relations with but this is not like they're right but like this is not a super new um, like I said old old criticism um, between the deontologists and the uh, consequentialists Sufficiency versus necessity and the maximiz maximization of outcomes. The consequentialist version of the duty to rescue also suffers from a tension between, on the one hand, the intuitions evoked by its premises, and on the other hand, on the uh, yeah, on the other hand, the way it justifies its conclusions. We believe that a child in a situation of the kind described by Singer has a right to our assistance, and that we have a corresponding duty to rescue the child. Unless our intervention brings with it a serious threat to our own well-being, there can be no justification whatsoever for us not rescuing the child. However, consequentialism, concerned with total outcomes rather than with individual rights, is open to the possibility that we are not only permitted, but actually morally required to leave the child to drown. Singer's justification of the, du of the duty to rescue takes place against the background of a more more general argument, holding that we should pay attention to all the interests of all those affected by our planned course of action and weigh up all these interests and adopt the course of action most likely to maximize the interests of those affected. Yeah, see, they're just going to start yelling at, oh, what do you mean by most likely? Like, this is, uh, again, a second, this is not a new argument. And um, the consequence is that the, uh, you, that no one actually knows how to add up happiness. This means, however, that we may face situations in which the duty to rescue the child in the pond may be outweighed by a duty to save other people somewhere else. And this is the old thing, like, should you kill baby Hitler? There's a kid drowning in the pond, but it turns out it's baby Hitler. And should you go, like, if you had a time machine and you could, like, stop someone from, uh, you know, saving baby Hitler drowning in the pond and thereby uh, preventing the World War II and, like, all the atrocities therein, it's, um, do you do that? But how does anyone know that at the time? Like, oh I saved baby Hitler and only to realize later that like you could have maybe stopped the worst thing that ever happened in like uh, 20th century Europe like I this is old again another old argument against consequentialism and I also think against the ontology I don't really know what it is to follow a rule but the consequentialists can't tell me how to add uh, things up in the last account because we don't actually know how anything turns out so All right, so author says, consider, for instance, a case in which you are on your way to the post office to mail a sum of money which will save 10 persons from dying from starvation in some faraway country, but only if the money is mailed today. You pass a pond where a child is about to drown. You realize that you can easily pull the child out of the water, but it will take some time to do so, and the post office is about to close. So if you stop to save the drowning child, you will not make it in time to the post office, and then you will not be able to save the 10 starving persons. From a consequentialist point of view, the law Loss of 10 lives would be more a morally worse outcome than the loss of one life hence your duty is to proceed to the post office and let the child drown yeah i mean there's the thing you don't know actually what's going to happen maybe that kid will save 100 people because you saved that kid so it's like you can't add this up but like you can sort of do this uh math in your head 10 people is more than one people then i should let that one person die and i'll save the 10 people yeah 
So the author says, now this result would seem counterintuitive to many of us. Whatever duty you may have to save the starving 10, it cannot set aside the more urgent duty to rescue the drowning child. In the words of Patricia Greenspan, I do not have moral leeway to pass an accident victim whom no one else is available to help on the grounds that I have given or plan to give aid somewhere else. Now, this is hard. I think Peter Singer would take a hard line here and just say, nope. If I'm saving 10 people down the road, I don't have to save this one person here. Like, I think the hard consequentialists would just straight up disagree. And the fact that they say I do not have moral leeway is like, that's just your, like, that's just your opinion, Patricia. Like, what are you, what's your argument there? Um, yeah. Um, they, this is not an argument. People just think this, like you, in some sense, you would feel worse because you were like watching someone suffer actively as opposed to the starving, which is apparently in a faraway place. Um, now that's a different argument. Like if you were watching it, like actively seeing suffering and you, you just like sort of ignore it to get your go all about your business. It's like, okay, maybe there is something deficient with you because you are ig ignoring the pleas that are like hitting your face. Like it, that is something, but you know, the consequentialist would just say, this is not an argument here. Just saying you don't have it doesn't mean, like, that you're right about that. That's just, like, your opinion, man. Okay. Some might think that this is because we have greater obligations to take care of what is in the area near us. Whether this is th whether this is threats that will cause harm at a distance or persons who are or will be victims. Yeah, so I guess that is a point that if there's some harm here, you want to, like, sort of protect your local... Uh, area for whatever reason. Okay. However, this is not a strong argument against the consequentialist position, since the consequentialist may simply counter by questioning the validity of our intuitions. She could claim that they just reflect our prejudice for proximity and against distance, in time as well as in space. Yeah. We are moved to act by what we have in front of us here and now, and find it easy to ignore consequences more re remote in time and space, regardless of the relative importance of the interests at stake. I mean, that's fair. Like, you know, maybe someone else will uh, save the 10 starving people, but you know for a fact that someone's drowning right here and right now. No one else can help because you are the only person there. You can't rely on, like, you know, some miracle. But on the other hand, th if you're sending money to save 10 starving people, that's implying that they're going to live during the amount of time that you know that takes the money to get there and so something else could happen in that uh you know intervening few days for the money to get sent maybe not but like you could be very certain that it won't happen but it still there's still more uh wiggle room there a stronger objection against the consequentialist position would instead point to the fact that while it is necessary that you intervene to rescue the child from drowning, it is not necessary that you get to the post office in time in order for the starving 10 to be saved. Of course, it is necessary that you arrive in time at the post office for the 10 to be saved by you, but even if you do not get there in time, there is still the possibility that someone else can contribute the sum of money required for saving lives. This is just what I said. Okay, so this is one of those things. If you are thinking it when reading a philosophy paper, it is because the author wants you to be thinking it quite often. They have set you up to think what they want, and then they're going to, you know, use that to their effect, which they are doing right now. Hence, your money is sufficient to save the starving ten, but not necessary. The child in the pond, on the other hand, can only be saved by you. If you do not pull the child out of the water, no one else will do it. Hence, you have a duty of necessity regarding the child that you do not have regarding the starving ten. Once again, we find that consequentialist idea that we have a duty to rescue whenever our intent intervention is sufficient to save someone's life tends to confuse our moral priorities. Yeah, so sufficiency versus necessity. Okay, and this is interesting because I, I read a paper that is basically making the same arguments or made the very similar arguments. This is from when? 2011. Okay, the one I read was uh, more recent. It was a newly published paper, I think. Um, so they were making some of these similar sort of things there. It's not the same, but like uh, they made some of the uh, this sort of thing as a uh, same sort of argument. Okay, what if your intervention would be as necessary for the rescue of the starving 10 as it is for the child in the pond? Yeah, so in other words, there's 10 people over there and there's like one person over here and the one person's closer, I guess, but like there's no one else in the area. That is only you can save the child in the pond and only you can save the starving 10, but you cannot do both. 
Victor Andre says there's a movie called Circle. They have to decide to die so the game can continue. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of this, like, sort of media now, too. Like, sacrifice yourself for the greater good. Can you do this? Yeah. <laughs> we keep after having to up the ante in our media or else, uh, like, people get bored. It's like, oh, my God, you have, like, Squid Game. Like, some people have to die. One way th they go is killing the older people. Yeah, it's like, exactly. Like, what do you do um, at that point? Yeah, how do you keep it going? Like, who's going to get the money in the end? Or who's going to get to live, whatever it is? Okay. You know, so it's a movie called... Uh, I did not see that. But I'm just, like, thinking, like, all the dumb things, like, I've seen. And, like, you know, all the games. Like, you, you push a button and you get a million bucks, but, like, someone dies. Like, random things like that. <sighs> okay. You, if you can't save both the kid or the 10 people. Here, you, the author says, we would have to admit that you should give priority to the starving 10. Numbers do not decide by themselves what is the morally right action, but in a case where two groups of people have equally good claims on your support, your intervention is necessary to both of them and none of them sends a relationship to you that gives you special relation and duties to its members, it seems reasonable that you should choose to help the more numerous group. All right, so this is just reduces to the trolley problem at this point. You've got five, you've got 10 people on one track and one person on this track, and you have to hit the button to uh, move the trolley onto the one person track because it's going to hit the uh, 10 person but you could choose to save the one if you wanted to yeah but I mean this is just trolley problem now but unlike the consequentialism quantity is here secondary to quality in the sense that it's that it is first when we have ascertained that there is no difference in terms of necessity or special relationships that we let numbers decide our duty okay yeah so like if it's your kid and then there's 10 people you still have to save your kid but this is just very uh, straight up deontological thinking they're arguing the deontological point against um the consequentialist so i don't actually think the consequentialist would give a rat's ass about anything this argument is saying they're saying yeah it's sufficient and you're hoping that like someone else will save the 10 people but you have very good reason to think that like no one is going to save those 10 people from starving so it's like well how certain of you are are you that like of any of this stuff that no one's gonna save the drowning kid yeah you have a lot of information about that but you are also extremely certain that no one is going to save the uh, starving people also so the, the consequentialists could push back right here it's like these are uh, basically what I'm thinking are kind of standard uh, uh, deontological Kantian arguments against consequentialism just uh, oriented in the way the author wants but I, I mean it, it's nicely done but I am not seeing anything like super fancy here but like they're right about what they're saying it's just there's going to be pushback from the consequentialist okay and here we go the deontological version of the duty to rescue section 2 like Peter Singer, Alan Gur Gerwith, Gerwith, Gur Gewirth, Gewirth. <laughs> I apologize how I say everyone's name is Gewirth. In his discussion of the duty to rescue, takes his point of departure in a case of a drowning person. Whenever some person knows that unless he acts in a certain way, other persons will suffer basic harms, and she is proximately able to act in these ways with no comparable cost to herself, it is her moral duty to act to prevent these harms. Suppose Carr, who is an excellent swimmer, is lolling in the sun on a deserted beach. On the edge of the beach near her is her motor boat, to which is attached a long, stout rope. Suddenly, she becomes aware that another person, who I shall call Davis, is struggling in the water some yards away. Carr knows that the water is about 30 feet deep at that point. Davis shouts for help. He is obviously in immediate danger of drowning. Just so you know, if anyone's in immediate danger of drowning, you're pro they're probably not going to have the breath to be yelling for help. They might, but it's gonna they're going to go under real fast. Okay, Carr sees that she could easily save Davis by swimming out to her, no, to him, or at least by throwing him the rope from her boat. But Carr simply doesn't want to bother, even though she is aware that Davis probably will drown unless she rescues him. Davis drowns. Okay, so we've got somebody who just likes getting their tan, and someone's drowning, and they're like, nah, I like my tan. 
Here, the background is not the consequentialist one of being required to prevent bad things from happening wherever, whenever one can do so at little cost to oneself. That is, when one's intervention is sufficient to prevent bad outcomes. Instead, the formulation, unless he acts in certain ways, indicates we are required to intervene when it is necessary to prevent basic harms and when we can do so at no comparable cost to ourselves. The reference to basic harms also implies that we have no duty to intervene to prevent bad outcomes in general, but only to prevent certain harms that interfere with other people's right to basic well-being. However, we still need to clarify the meaning of comparable cost. The, deontolo the deontological version presupposes that the rescuer as well as the rescuee have rights to basic well-being. That is, while, that is why we have a moral duty to intervene when it is necessary to prevent someone else from suffering basic harm. But this also raises questions of conflicts of rights. To what extent is the rescuing agent supposed to sacrifice aspects of her own well-being for the sake of maintaining the basic well-being of some, some other person? Uh, Gewirth's story about Carr and Davis does not provide us with any clues here, since Carr obviously does not risk any bodily harm at all by rescuing Davis. No, they rescued their tan, and their tan is super important to them. Like, clearly you are not thinking of the party they're going to later, and if they ruin their tan, they're going to look like a fool, and they're not going to, you know, have a good night. Like, seriously. <coughs> like, people are not... Like, vanity is sanity, my friends. My grandma used to say. The comparable cost condition. At one extreme, we have the possibility that every loss up to the level of loss of that... <laughs> Up, every loss up to the level of loss that the rescuee is confronted with can be required of the rescuing agent. So I could should sacrifice everything up until my life to save someone else's life, I guess. If the person in need of rescue is about to lose her life, then everything except the loss of her own life can be required of the rescuing agent. Yeah, see, this person's ahead of me. <laughs> the author is. This seems too demanding, however, as Jonathan Kwong has pointed out. If a child is drowning and X can rescue the child at the cost of muddying their trousers, most will agree that X is required to save the child. But suppose instead X can only save the child at the cost of becoming a paraplegic. Here I think many would agree X is no longer required by morality to save the child. Since the death of the child is worse than the cost of becoming a paraplegic, the only explanation is that the agent relative considerations have altered what moral morality permits. Yeah, like how many like limbs would you sacrifice for someone else's life? Yeah. Again, you don't know if they're going to die. You think they're going to die. Okay. To be sure, professional lifeguards, close friends, relatives, and others who stand in a special professional, contractual, or emotional relationship to a drowning person may have a relational duty to risk even their lives when necessary to save that person. But in the absence of such special relationships, we assume that the re rescuing agent, too, has a right to a be to basic well-being that cannot be set aside for the sake of maintaining that same right of a drowning person. This is what the comparable cost condition is about. Now, granting that becoming a paraplegic would violate the comparable comparable cost condition, we have not said anything about what kinds of harm a rescuing agent should be morally required to accept for himself. Certain kinds of harm seem trivial compared to what a drowning person is about to lose and would hence be consistent with the comparable cost condition. For instance, an opera singer may catch a common cold if she tries to rescue a drowning man, and as a consequence, she will be unable to perform arias for some time. But does this imply that she is entitled to refuse to rescue the drowning man? That would be absurd. After all, the opera singer's uh, loss is limited and temporary, while the drowning person is about to suffer a loss that is total and permanent. Here we may have a point of departure for a more principled argument concerning the contents of the comparable cost condition. We will claim that total and permanent losses of capacities for some action constitute attacks on any agent's basic well-being of a kind that is ruled out by the comparable cost condition, while limited and temporary losses of capacities for action may be acceptable according to this condition. Yeah, so again, then we're talking about what is the extent. Like if I'm going to lose um, hearing in one ear, now, I can get by with hearing in only one other ear, but, like, again, that might be pretty bad. You can't, uh, you know, orient yourself in the world as easily if you can only hear out of one ear. Like, yeah, so say you lose an ear and an eye. You can get by in modern society pretty well with only one eye and one ear. But, again, you're losing your parallax vision. You're losing sense of balance. All sorts of things are going to go if you lose your, uh, like, ear and eyes and, so and stuff. So it's like, yeah, this might be temporary, or like it may be like bad for like say for the next like 30 years or something 
It's like how there's still ways you could uh, muddy this up, as it were. It's like you have a basic right of well-being, but like you can start saying, well, how long is a temp? How long is temporary? And how long, like how and what else? What what exactly? How bad is it going to be? for like that temporary time like so if i say you're gonna save this person's life but you have to go to hell for like half an hour so you're gonna be in like the worst torture of your life but it's only gonna be a half an hour would you do it i mean i don't know half an hour how bad would it be would you like never want to like live again after that half hour but it was only half hour like would it mess up your your mind no idea but like again these are hypotheticals that we don't really understand of course, I'm saying, if you're just going to get your pants dirty, who cares? They're pants. You can get more pants. But, um, like, that's the thing. There's a limit to how much you can do and how much, like, your life is going to change, even in the short term. Okay. The right to basic well-being. One thing I want to say about this now, I was thinking about this. This always reeks of, like, these discussions when we're talking about, like, saving kids far away. It always comes down as, like, a patronistic and like very first worldy saying like oh okay we have to go help these other people other places it's like yes we do but like it always comes off as is like the the people writing aren't actually seeing people that need help every day you can go like if you're not in new york city you can go into new york city and you can see bums on the street every day that need help all the time if you were to go and help all the ones you could see well you could make a job out of that like there are people who that's what they work and they work in the homeless services thing but like that's what they do all day but if they were to stop doing that like where they were helping people like stop doing everything else they were doing just to do that you'd basically just be a monk helping the poor at that point and you'd be you know begging for alms it's like you're changing your entire life you could reorient the entire world like everyone would have to reorient the entire world i'm not even saying that's a bad thing like should we all just go reorient the entire world everyone's lives around you know helping the poorest maybe that's what we should be doing but like it's a massive massive change and i don't feel like uh it feels like people are just separated from seeing um problems that they think that like this is a good idea that like if only we would just go help people more <laughs> it's like you can go help people all day if you want like just go out and there's going to be bums you can go help it's like you won't get anything done otherwise like nothing anywhere else no philosophy papers written so but yeah, that said, rant over. Okay, the right to basic well-being. Yeah, and like I was saying, if everyone has any problems with what I'm saying or just like uh, <laughs> thinks I'm off my rocker, let me know. The right to basic well-being. Basic well-being, then, will be taken to include not only life, but also those other physical and mental abilities that are required for agency in general, and not only for certain specific... Uh, certain specific actions hence no agent is morally obliged to risk her life nor to expose herself to a total and permanent loss of such capacities as the ability to use one's limbs the ability to see hear speak and so on the ability to stay concentrated and focused the ability to perceive and interpret one's natural and social environment correctly not suffering from delusions and so on again how do you actually measure the ability to perceive and interpret one's natural and social environment correctly because you got to like you know go to school learn some stuff to actually understand what the hell is going on in your social environment. Like, so that means you have to go to school instead of rescuing somebody because how else are you going to correctly interpret your social world? That's not so easy. Go study sociology. Not so simple. Complicated. Things to learn. Okay. But, like, see, right here, this is what I'm worried about. Like, this actually is, right there is, um, this is an unreasonable ask. Because it's not what you think it is. You To be able to interpret one's world accurately is super difficult. Okay, accordingly, no agent can be morally required to make a total and permanent sacrifice of any aspects of her basic well-being for the sake of rescuing another agent's life. That is, unless her duty to rescue is also a relational duty obliging her to do more than is required by the comparable cost condition. However, a rescuing agent may be required to make a limited and temporary sacrifice of aspects of basic well-being, such as having her hearing impaired without becoming completely deaf for a few days or suffering from a mild headache, not severe enough to make thinking and concentrating impossible for a, mile, for a day or two. This is how we should understand the comparable cost condition. Yeah, see, again, in examples, it makes sense. I don't know if uh, there is a principled way of saying this. 
Oh, yeah. Here we go. Author knows this. Of course, temporary is a vague term. Is a headache that lasts a year still to be called temporary. It is certainly not a permanent affliction, but it is not a short-term experience either. We might avoid this problem by simply saying that it, that when it is unclear whether a loss of basic well-being will be limited and temporary, we should leave it to the rescuing agent to decide whether she should intervene or not. Okay, so now we're just saying, hey, it's up to you. Give it a shot. Leave it to the rescuing agent. It's like, it's up to you how bad it is. Nah, see, that's the whole point. If you're going to do ethics, you I want to say, it is not up to you. It's up to the ethics. Okay. In these cases of uncertainty, then, the duty to rescue will become an imperfect duty in the sense indicated by Kant and Mill. According to Kant, this means that the duty has in it a latitude for doing more or less, and no specific limits can be assigned to what should be done. In Mill's terminology, those duties are imperfect in which, though the act is obligatory, the particular occasions of performing it are left to our choice. Yeah, see, this is a thing. You're saying you should do it, but we don't know when or how. And so... This is like the end all, the end of the argument here, where you're kind of ducking out. They were saying all the stuff sounds really good, but they can't actually give you a principled um, way of deciding what needs to be done. When we hold, continuing, when we hold that an agent has no duty to expose herself to a total and permanent loss of any aspect of of basic well-being for the sake of rescuing a person in mortal danger, this applies not only to the dangers of the rescue operation itself, but also to the expected. Uh, eff effects of rescuing the person in question. Just as the agent has no duty to jump in the ocean to save a drowning person if she herself cannot swim, so she cannot, she, so she has no duty to rescue a drowning person who, in the past, has made credible th threats that he will kill, will kill or mutilate the agent if he ever gets the opportunity to do so. We have no duty to risk our own basic well-being by providing opportunities for someone, somebody else, to do, to do us unjustifiable harm. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone was worried about that. Um, I wonder why they even put this in. I want, this kind of smells of a uh, reviewer said, hey, what about this case? And they said, okay, I'll put that in. But like, no one was saying, hey, you gotta go kill the, you gotta go rescue this person that will kill you if uh, you attempt to rescue them. Like, really? Is that a problem? Like, on anyone's account? But fine. Possible exceptions. Relational duties and fairness. We should note, however, that the comparable cost condition can be set aside by an agent's relational duties. For instance, if the agent has chosen to become a bodyguard, she may, w she may well be morally obliged to risk even her life for the sake of protecting her client's basic well-being. Likewise, parents, lovers, and close friends are morally expected to risk their basic well-being when it is necessary to maintain that, basic, that same basic well-being of their children, partners, and loved ones. But all these relationships should have a background in have a background in the agent's voluntary commitments and hence be at least indirectly consistent with her right to freedom. Only in this way can there be a morally justified duty for the rescuing agent to take risks beyond what is required by the comparable cost condition for the sake of saving another person's life. All right, so now we're bringing in the uh, right to freedom here. I'm not entirely sure why. What are we doing? I mean, I don't understand. Why do we need, why do we need freedom all of a sudden? I mean, I kind of assumed that we always had choice here. That we always had, uh, like, the freedom to choose to help or not. <clears throat> Let's find out. Author says, Could an agent's duty to rescue be limited for other reasons than for being inconsistent with the agent's own right to basic well-being? One such reason is suggested by Liam Murphy in his discussion of fairness in relation to the duty to rescue. Given a situation in which there are many potential rescuers, you being one of them, and many potential rescuees, we may claim that each rescuer is responsible for a certain share of rescuees. But what happens if the other rescuer refuses, rescuers refuse to intervene? Will you have to rescue more persons than is your fair share, or are you entitled to limit your rescue activities to include just that number of persons that is your fair share? According to Murphy, it seems at least intuitively plausible to hold that we should do our fair share, which can amount to a great sacrifice in certain circumstances. What we cannot be required to do is other people's shares as well as well as our own. Alright, I don't like this at all. Because, like, if there are other rescuers, but they're not acting, I'm just not going to call them rescuers then, and then you have to 
treat everyone as needing rescue without any other rescuers then in that case i would say you do what you can for as many people as you can but um like the idea that there's a fair share like i don't understand well the other people are not acting they're not rescuers anymore they're crappy people if like they could be rescuing and they're not um so but like that's it like but there is no more uh, fair share because they other people took themselves out of the equation Okay, here I would like to turn to Murphy's conclusion on its head, however. While you cannot be morally obliged to make a greater a great sacrifice, since this seems to imply a loss of your basic well-being, you may well be morally obliged to do more than your fair share of a rescue operation. If other potential rescuers do not intervene to save some persons in need of being rescue, rescued, and you can save these rescuees at little cost to yourself, then it is your duty to rescue them, even if this means that you will have to save more persons than would have been the case had all potential rescuers done their fair share. This is the cost to yourself, not the fairness of your share that you that might limit your duty to rescue. I agree with the uh, author here, not for, for my reasons, not for theirs, because look, if everyone did the right thing in the world and like scare quotes on right thing, like everyone was helping the homeless, everyone was helping like the poor and, and disenfranchised and the like the people not in power, then you would have each of us would have to do basically very little, like just a very little piece. And then we could all like have a much better world. But like, that's the thing. Like, but this is all the rescuers saying, all right, we're not going to do it. It's like, well, then the people who are willing to do it or have the moral, you know, drive to do it then they are going to have to do more but like that's the thing this is like there is no share fair share at that point like the concept of a fair share i don't think this makes any sense actually like there is no fair share like that's not how you can think of it because you can't rely on like the rest of the the uh, humanity do what you think is the right thing and i'm not even saying it is the right thing i'm just saying what you think their fair share is like there is no objective fair share here like only if like okay you've got three life cards and only one of them is acting that's a problem because then you if you would agree to uh you know separate it out like uh, everyone take a third then they're just abusing uh then they're not really life cards but like you had an agreement with them and they're not there but like the idea that there's any sort of fair share it's like fair in terms of what like only if you had like a contract with these people okay the duty to rescue and the distant starving Author says, as we've already seen, Peter Singer claims that it makes no moral difference whether the person I can help is a neighbor's child 10 yards from me or a Bengali whose name I shall never know 10,000 miles away. Can the duty to rescue really be extended to global humanitarian aid in this way? Do individuals have a global duty of necessity to rescue? As we've already noted, we have a duty to, uh, of necessity to rescue someone whose basic well-being is endangered if our intervention is indeed necessary to prevent this from happening. If it is true that certain people will die from starvation in some distant third world country unless you contribute a certain sum of money, and if it is also true that this will not deprive you of any aspect of your basic well-being, then you have a duty to make that contribution. However, it is very rare that we can establish a causal relationship between one potential donor here and some victims of starvation there, such that if this particular donor does not contribute her money, these people will die from starvation. It is not like the case of the drowning child, where a limited number of people are present, and you know that if none of the others intervene, then it is necessary that you intervene. In the case of the distant starving, it is not at all obvious who has a duty of necessity to help them. Why you? Why not your neighbor? Why not other citizens of your country? Why not any other citizens of any other wealthy country? This is the what aboutism. They're straight up going, what about other people? Why aren't they doing stuff? Like, seriously, what aboutism? Like, that's an argument you're going to put on here? Like, what aboutism? Seriously? Like, come on, man. Like, I, I don't buy this at all. Yeah, there is no causal, uh, obvious causal connection between you and that other people but like again you were reading too much into the causal uh thing of like you and the kid uh, drowning maybe you know like uh you know uh, a dolphin will pick the kid up and push him out of the water that could happen you don't know and like maybe like food will like mana will fall from the sky and save the starving people you don't know but you're full of shit you know that like your money if you understand that there is an organization that will apply the food in a good place that it will work this is just like oh i don't know i'm not like certain that's crap yeah. Okay. To place the burden of contribution on your shoulders alone would be unfair, given that there are countless other individuals who are equally well off and who could provide the contribution. <laughs> yeah, get, go get a, exactly. Go get the job, kid. <laughs> yeah. So other people could do this too. They could put the contribute the, the required contribution in. 
On the other hand, for each and every one of these other individuals, it will also be true that her specific contribution is not necessary since it could be provided by some other member of this group of wealthy potential donors. Hence, we could we seem to lack what Violetta and Ignesti calls a morally determinate situation connecting a particular rescuer with a particular rescuee. So who has a duty to rescue the distant starving? Yeah, again, these people are putting so much weight on the necessary condition. Granted, that was sort of the premise of this paper. That like you can separate necessary and sufficient but again it's not what's necessary and sufficient are also going to be vague and so that's a problem here they're treating like the necessary and sufficient are not vague and like oh it's not completely necessary that you give these people money because they might live otherwise you don't know that and maybe it is necessary maybe the kid drowning is not gonna maybe he'll figure out how to swim in the next 10 seconds who knows it's not like it's uh that clear Relational duties of states, and I only uh, I just want to be uh, like specific. I only bring that up that like the kids, of course, not going to figure out how to swim in the next ten seconds. But I'm saying if you are going to apply the metaphysics like this and bring up ridiculous things, you're going to get the same problems coming back to bite you here. If you're going to accuse people of vagueness, I'm going to accuse you of vagueness, and that's exactly what's happening. It's like you can't start throwing around vagueness and not realize that you're being vague too. Relational duties of states. As we've already noted, the duty to rescue comes not only in the form of duties of necessity, but also in the form of relational duties. Now, relational duties apply not only to individuals who stand in a special emotional or professional relationship to the rescuee, such as parents, friends, lifeguards, and so on. Relational duties also apply to institutions and indirectly to the persons who are in charge or of or work for them. Yeah, I mean, as a citizen, I have rights of my country. And like if they fail those rights, then like I would have I could have a beef with like the government. Okay. Especially important when it comes to dealing with human afflictions like starvation is the institution of the state. This is so since starvation, unlike the case of a drowning person, cannot be categorized as a sudden occurrence of danger that threatens the basic well-being of some individual and that can be averted by the intervention of some other individual. See right here again. If everyone knew how to swim because you had a swimming program in your state, then it wouldn't be a problem. And if you had like a food program where everyone had food, enough food in your state, then it wouldn't be a problem. But again, you can do the same argument for the swimming crap. And maybe if you educated people morally, then you wouldn't have to worry about like people not helping because they would already help. Maybe. Seems unlikely, but it's technically possible. Victor, you don't know how to swim? Okay. I mean... That's fine. Like, it's okay. You don't have to know how to swim. But I'm saying you can't. I mean, the point I was making was that you can't say that, like, you know, the state is responsible for this and not that when they could be responsible for both or responsible for neither. Like, this is the thing. Just because, like, maybe everyone should know how to swim. I'm not saying, like, maybe swimming is a natural good that everyone should know how to do. I'm not making that claim. I'm just saying that the state might somehow think they were responsible for ensuring that their uh, citizens could swim like yeah it's not clear what the state's res uh, responsibilities are people like to say oh the state's responsible for this and not for that that's just like your opinion man what the state is needs to be responsible for like you have some theory about that these things can change as like yeah my dad couldn't swim worth a damn should he have learned how? Sure. It would have been, it would have been more fun on like when we went to the pool when I was a kid. It's like, okay, my mom could swim though. Okay. So instead, starvation is often the final outcome of a long process of a deterioration of communal life in which citizens are deprived of political rights and hence also of the means to voice their grievances. We need Shane here for this. Is it really or is it like war and all sorts of other stuff that cause like famine uh, that we just can't organize? So is it really a long process of deterioration or is it like some warlord uh, seized power and decided to kill off their enemies and burn their food? Like Napoleon um, burnt, like stole all some, some people's food when he was marching through Europe, basically to starve them to death. He, he steals all, some, all the people's food before the winter. They're going to starve. Uh, I have a buddy who is descendant from like the people who had to flee from Napoleon stealing all their, their food. It's like... So is it a long process of deterioration of communal life or is it war? Maybe. It's probably both. I don't know these things, but like, again, this claim here I am already a little doubtful about. It has been pointed out that there has never been a famine in a functioning multi-party democracy. 
Uh, okay, maybe. And since the state, and more precisely the government of the state, has a relational duty to maintain and protect the political rights of its citizens, this is the responsibility that comes with political sovereignty. The government will also have a duty to support those of its citizens who starve as a consequence of governmental misrule. I guess fair. If you have a good government, then no one starves. Or there's no famine. There's definitely people starving. But there's no like widespread famine. I mean, we had famine here in the U.S. in like the Dust Bowl in the 30s. I guess they don't count that. Okay, continuing. Of course, to the extent that the government of other countries have contributed to create adverse condition, conditions of development for the starving nation by, for instance, maintaining very unfair conditions of trade, it could be argued that they too have a relational duty to support the starving. This would be a compensatory kind of relational duty similar to the one that figures in the argument that the person who pushed a child into the water also has a duty to pull the child out of the water. Thomas Pogg has made an argument to this effect, claiming that the world poverty is a consequence of institutional arrangements to which most of the world's affluent are making uncompensated contributions. Yeah, we have enough food in this area and we don't have enough food in that area. This is like not, we've known about this for a while. This is sort of capitalism at work. It shifts like money and food around. So the people who have the power get the money, the good money and the good food. And then the people who don't, you know, they starve. But, um, yeah, I agree. Nothing wrong with like this argument here, at least. <laughs> I agree with this one. Um, what else? Anything else to say? Yeah, I, I just like that there has never been a famine in a, mu a functioning multi-party democracy. That's interesting. I just, uh, to be fair, functioning multi-party democracies, I don't know how long they've been around for. And maybe they do other things poorly. Maybe not. I, I'm not a historian. Okay. An international duty to rescue. Could there be a duty for another state to intervene in support of victims of starvation in a poor country that has nothing to do with past wrongdoing on the part of, inter of the intervening state? For instance, if it is necessary to remove the dictatorial government of the poor country in order to end starvation there and a neighboring country has the military means to do so, would that country thereby also have a duty to intervene? What if this military intervention can be expected to result in casualties among the intervening soldiers? Is it still a duty for the neighboring country to intervene? Yeah, so should we go take over, you know, one of these countries that is doing bad and just like set up like an outpost of the United States? And uh, we swear there's no oil there. Okay, continuing. Whether or not we accept that there is a duty to intervene militarily in another country for the sake of rescuing its starving people will depend on how we conceive of international relations in general. If we think of states as be, uh, being members of a community of na nations, we might well accept that peoples have a duty to assist other peoples living under unfavorable conditions that prevent their having a just or decent political and social regime. This international duty of assistance could then include military interventions, given that such interventions are necessary and feasible. However, to the extent that we accept such an international version of the duty to rescue, it will be more like a duty of necessity than a relational duty. That is, in the absence of alliances or treaties that commit one state to pay special attention to the communal well-being of another state, just as individuals are supposed to intervene in each other's rescue when it is necessary and when they can do so without sacrificing their own well-being, so one state will have a duty to intervene for the sake of saving the people of another state, but only when it is necessary and when the intervening state can do so without sacrificing important aspects of its own communal basic well-being. And you see right here, how do you define what counts as important aspects of its own communal basic well-being? We would like health care in the United States of America. We do not think this is an important aspect of our communal basic well-being. This is generally thought to be a problem. However, we have a very nice military. And we go blow stuff up other places. I'm not even complaining about blowing stuff up other places. It's just the idea that we there is any way to recognize, uh, reckon what is the basic communal well-being versus what we can give up is going to be a politically fraught decision. Um, you're not going to be able to argue this point anywhere because there's going to be people saying don't go help them there's people here that need more help and then they say well oh, don't spend it on those slackers here it's like you're always going to have an argument about what counts as important aspects of our communal basic well-being so this is problematic i don't disagree with the arg the author here this is a good idea the problem is there's going to be no way to actually uh 
agree to what this ca consists in. <coughs> okay. Hence, the duty of a government to rescue another nation will be limited by the government's relational duty to its own citizens not to endanger their basic well-being, at least not without their consent, or unless it is necessary to pre preserve their own political community. However, governments have a relational duty to its own citizens not only to the endanger their... Not not only not to endanger their basic well-being, but also to promote their well-being. This can be expected to set further limits to their duty to intervene militarily for the sake of rescuing citizens of another country. Hence, we may conclude that the duty to rescue indeed can be applied at an international level. However, the extinction of the international application of the duty to rescue will be limited by the negative and positive relational duties of governments to their citizens. Again, yes, I agree with them, but they have no conclusion here. There's the whole thing. It's like, well, you have to balance things out. No shit. It's like, okay. <sighs> Summary of conclusions. How, and that, this is it for this paper. The consequential version of the duty to rescue exhibited certain weaknesses in its inability to distinguish between relational duties and duties of necessity and hence of different degrees of moral responsibility among potential rescuers. According to the consequentialist, you have a duty to prevent bad things from happening whenever you can do so, regardless of whether it is necessary that you you do it or not. This focus on sufficiency rather than necessity in combination with the maximization aim of consequentialism also imply that you ha might have to ignore some rescuees whom only you can rescue for the sake of rescuing a larger group of rescuees who could be rescued by other people as well. The deontological version of the duty to rescue, on the other hand, accepts that you have a duty to rescue only when it is necessary that you do so. However, since the deontological version is based on the idea that both rescuer and rescuee have moral rights, it brings with it an obvious risk that these rights will conflict. The formula of comparable cost, hence, needs to be clarified in order that we should be able to know how far these rescuing agent's duties extend and what sacrifices she has to accept for herself. We outlined an idea of the basic of the right to basic well-being according to which no agent should have to risk neither her life nor a total or permanent loss of the physical and mental capacities generally needed for agency for the sake of rescuing another agent. That is, unless the agent has voluntarily entered relationships which bring with them relational duties that go beyond the comparable cost condition. With this elaboration of the deontological version of the duty to rescue, we will arrive at a relatively clear picture of what is involved in the duty to rescue and of the limits of this duty. Finally, we have applied our reasoning about the duty to rescue to the international scene and established, at least in an tentative way, that there might indeed be an international duty to rescue, but that, du that this duty is also limited by the relational duties of the intervening state or government to its own citizens. Okay. I mean, this is nice paper. Nice paper. Um, I've like I said, I've seen other stuff in this area. This uh, I think fits right in with a bunch of them. Uh, like the things I read, like for all I know, like they referenced this paper. Like this would have been something that in one of the later papers I've read that they, like someone else, might have uh, referenced. Like I don't think this paper made any grand leaps or bounds in like uh, their philosophical analysis. It was a nice application of different theories and looking at like sufficiency and necessity and Kantian arguments and like the de deontological arguments as opposed to uh, the consequentialist uh, position. And then again, with if you're going to do this in the uh, uh, deontological version, then what do you do? You have to compare rights and then you have to know what exactly uh, the comparable cost is, um, which again is going to be a, uh, some sort of addition up of like you're adding up cost to yourself as opposed to like worldly goods, but maybe you know that better. Again, these all this stuff is going to be relation, uh, not relation, is relative to you and what how much are you willing to risk and how much are you willing to uh you know say this is how the world is and that's what I need to do given how I think the world actually is. Like the necessity again. How do you know that certain things are going to happen? Now, you know it's sufficient that if you do something, you will save these people, but you do not know if they're going to die anyway. And it's like, you, how much, do you, how confident are you actually in uh, your apprehension of the world, your appraisal of the world? And that's kind of hard. These things get vague very fast, very, very, very fast when you start pushing on them. And so the idea that like all, any of this is going to have the final say, no, 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 no. But it's a nice way of looking at the problem. I think uh, this is, you know, they outlined the argument, the the, I th 
their general position reasonably well. Is this? Uh, I don't think it's any great shakes, but I, again, reasonably well done. I need to get my. Uh, I need to get the stupid on uh, my review stuff working. I need to have like. Um, I'm gonna have emotes, um, basically, and then we can have like a emote review. Like if you guys could vote uh, yay or nay on the papers, and that way we can have like uh, chat's opinion, my opinion, and we'll have different. Uh, you know, categories. So we'll have a yay or nay, like, you know. Like this sort of thing. But like, uh, I'm working on this, but I just have not had the time. Probably in the new year, maybe. So. But that's about it for this paper. 